The following episode of Film Talk is brought to you by HostGator. HostGator is a leading provider of shared, resold, VPS, and dedicated hosting solutions. Their award-winning support is available 24-7 via phone, email, and live chat. Discover why over 9 million websites trust HostGator and sign up for a new hosting package using the coupon code GAMEITALL and receive 25% off your first hosting plan. Hello everybody, welcome to another edition of Film Talk here on GameItAll.com. I am Brendan Wall and we are here talking with Ryan Colucci, the producer of a new uh, anime, an, sorry, animated uh, feature na called Orient City. Uh, you just saw right at the top there, that is the opening sequence uh, from Orient City that was filmed. And uh, yeah, thank you, welcome, uh, thank you for coming on the show. Oh, thanks for having me. And uh, so that opening sequence, like I said, just played. That that's what's been filmed so far, from what I understand. Uh, it, that's that's what you've gotten so far on the film. Is that correct? Yeah, that's so. It's myself and uh, John Borhuska is my partner on it. Um, we're co-directing, and then he's the lead animator. I'm the writer. Um, the only thing that we could do, just the two of us, essentially, is what you see. Uh, past that, uh, you're talking about. Uh, high frame counts in terms of characters and things like that. So uh, what you saw is about, as far as we can take it, just the two of us without, you know, it taking years of time. Okay. And, and is this, now I'm, I was trying to figure, find this out. I wasn't 100% sure. Is this a uh, plan to be a short or a feature length? So the, right now it's on Kickstarter and that is for the uh, quote unquote short which is the first, okay. which is 10 minutes long. The short is actually the first 10 minutes of the feature slash prequel to the feature. It won't be the exact 10 minutes of the feature. Uh, it okay. almost exists like a prequel to the feature, uh, but it, it it's a short and it actually feeds into the feature. Okay, so it's, it's almost like, it's kind of like a preview of uh, the larger, the longer uh, film. Yeah, but it's its own, like if you took it, as its own thing, it's still a contained story. Because I didn't want to just make, uh, yeah. hey, this, I'm just making this so I can make this other thing. Uh, our thought was, if we're going to do this, let's do it the best we can do it. Let's make sure that when people watch this, they're satisfied at the end of the 10 minutes. Yeah. Otherwise, you know, film executives and people like that might 
think it's awesome, but the audience might say, what the hell? I feel gypped here. Yeah, you don't want it to, to be continued. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And I definitely don't want that. And you don't get that. Fe- I don't think you get that feeling. But I hope at the end of it, you think, wow, I want to see more of this. That's, okay, cool. That's definitely the goal. All right. So uh, why don't you tell us a little bit about Orient City, like maybe about the plot. And uh, I just want to make sure people get all the information as well about where they can go to uh, do the Kickstarter page, donate and all that stuff. So... Orient City is about a fallen samurai who's kind of at the opening wasting away in an opium den. And he gets hired to protect this. Orient City itself is uh, a pretty violent place. Not a pretty violent place. It's a violent place. Uh, It's more like the world of Tarantino's Kill Bill than a regular society uh, where it has elements of traditional American West, but in sort of this world of feudal Asia. Uh, so this uh, Ronin is hired to protect this, uh, what is a wealthier family in Orient City, but he's set up to fail knowing that he is, you know, addicted to opium. And he bonds with one of the kids in the family and he does fail at his job and then he heads back to Orient city uh, looking for revenge. And that's kind of what the opening is. And he, you know, um, the feature itself would be more about the relationship between him and and the child and who was responsible for it. Like in the grand scheme of things, Um, Orient city itself, the world, hopefully we created something that's fairly unique we're mixing spaghetti western with a samurai culture, and uh, the city itself go, stretches vertically. Not, it's not flat at all, so it's built on rocks that jut out of the water, and everything is built upwards. So the city is connected by cable cars uh, or um, dwellings that are cut or carved into the rocks that stretch upward. So if you see the opening shot of the film, it kind of we wanted to set the world up. So it's kind of this long booming shot that goes from the water at the bottom all the way up and it stops at a saloon so we kind of set the world up you know right from the start where you're getting uh oriental uh features like uh dragons that are carved into things and then you wind up at this wild west type saloon that still has like the asian roof okay and um and now I noticed as well, uh, you have raised quite a bit of money on the site so far. Um, so are you pretty close? Are you getting pretty close to reaching your goal at this point? Or yeah, so we are, I think, hovering around twenty, just over twenty-three grand, and our goal is thirty thousand. Okay. Um, you know, it seems like a small fortune to me, <laughs> thirty thousand, but the fact that we're at twenty-three is pretty amazing. Um, the part. Part of it with Kickstarter is you got to figure um, the Kickstarter costs and then credit card processing fees, which turn out to be about eight and a half percent. And then you have to figure uh, reward costs plus shipping. So I yeah. actually did. Um, I feel like I'm a pretty smart guy and I budget my own feature films, uh, the live action stuff that I do. But when I did uh, with John Boar, we did a graphic novel in 2013. We had a Kickstarter. I totally miscalculated some of the reward costs and shipping and uh, the weight of the book, and I got killed. <laughs> so, <laughs> so that's what the thirty thousand also entails is costs like that uh, over and above the cost that it's going to take to actually complete this because it's hand drawn animation. So there's a lot of in between artists where if John Board does the keyframes. Say there's there's going to be 24 frames in a second. Each mm-hmm. character has a keyframe three times in that second. So he'll draw those three, and then we need to fill in the others. Um, we have about 6,000 frames total in the thing, which is a lot of drawings. Yeah, I was going to say that that is an insa- insane undertaking <laughs> and draw an entire uh, animated film. And even like, especially now that you mentioned that, it's also uh, planning on. You're also planning on making a feature length as well. Yeah, so that's, I mean, 
yeah, <laughs> that that will have a much bigger like we have a pretty small crew ready to go for this opening um okay. and that opening will if we're successful on kickstarter will be finished by december 1st and that includes all the rewards so really and i built about a month pad in for john Bohr and i to to do all the extra because we have artwork rewards where if people send us a picture of themselves we draw them as a samurai or things like that um so we have a month built in for those and then the actual opening it's the first 10 minutes itself will be done for the latest december 1st uh now on the feature side the budget would be slightly different because or sorry schedule because we would have it'd be a feature so we'd have you don't you can't take four or five years for a feature because <laughs> it's just not feasible uh, mm -hmm. and you would ramp up and instead of hiring three or four in between artists you'd hire 30 and then in our case it's 27. Uh, that's how the frame count works out uh, and the feature itself would take about 18 months and now is the feature uh the idea for the feature length uh version of this is that is that script already been written no is that just a, i'm actually no? going to uh asia over the summer to start researching i, I mean i've late i'm started we started laying out the outline uh but we've been focusing on this first 10 minutes um and also in terms because i'm going to write it so last year i directed a, a really small crime thriller live action thing uh which took up my time until we wrapped completely done in october and then we were mm -hmm. coloring until about february and actually our colorist was on star wars which is why it took so long which is cool oh, wow. um considering our film our our film's budget was probably catering for star wars for a day or two um but we finished march 1st and that's when it freed me up again and we kind of committed to doing this orient city and me, me making that my next film so we have the general outline or story points that we want and we have this whole world and the characters that we want to focus on but uh in terms of it being finished no it's not finished yet that's what i'm going to be doing for the most part over the next few months so that when we come out of this in december 1st there's a script for the future that's completely done and ready but it's not like uh the general treatment isn't done we kind of know where we're going with it okay and um because everything is hand drawn as well does that does that tend to like i don't i'm, I'm just not sure does that make it more expensive in the budget or does that just cut down costs a lot but make for like more labor i guess it it definitely it, it doesn't uh it is more expensive it is more yeah it is more expensive because uh, actually my first film i went to usc grad school for film producing and when i came out of there uh i was me and a partner started a film finance company and our first project actually wound up being the CG animated feature film Battle for Terra. Uh, mm -hmm. And it was kind of by accident. We found a sh we were looking for a live action film. We couldn't find one that we loved to do. And we saw a short animated film that we liked a lot. Uh, and I think the problem with animation is you meet the filmmakers and they say, oh, this took me seven years in my basement. And you have a seven minute short film. Uh, there was a feature, a short film called Rust Boy that we thought was awesome. And you talked to the director and it was like, this took years and years and it was like seven, six or seven minutes and it's like as a financier it gives you pause and you go whoa how are we going to make the feature it's going to take us 36 years so <laughs> we met with this guy and he's like yeah this took me a month and we were like all right let's we literally built an animation studio from scratch in los angeles when everyone was saying don't do that don't do that <laughs> and we were like yeah. every as people told us no it just was more like well, I guess we're going to do this. Uh, yeah, it's more of a challenge. Yeah, right? I guess we just had that attitude. We were probably young and stupid. And <laughs> uh, we had, so that was CG, and it gave me a good background into, uh, you know, I was not trained in animation in terms of producing or anything like that. And I think it helped us in the long run because we, uh, most people that come, that do animation come up through those ranks. So they're so mm -hmm. embedded in a system of doing things 
And we just looked at the system and said, how do we blow this system up? How do we make this the best film possible, but still at the cheapest budget? And, uh, you know, in the difference is in CG, you have a person that can build a model and they animate that model from start to finish in a scene, uh, kind of like a puppeteer. So there's less labor on the drawing side, but there's a lot of labor in each, in, in moving that uh, model. It's called rigging, and you rig the characters. You ever see a film that you think, well, why do the, those characters are moving kind of weird? Uh, yeah. It's because the rigging is done poorly. So as you can have the best character animator in the world on the CG side, but if he has a bad rig to work with, the character is going to move weird. Um, yeah, or a lot of times you'll see uh, a scene where a character, an uh, animated movie, or you'll see a character in the background kind of kind of posed weird or kind of moving a little odd, <laughs> and you think, oh, okay, maybe they didn't put a lot of uh, a lot into that just because it was so far in the background. They think it's not very noticeable, but you exactly. Pick up you pick up on it right away. Exactly. And, you know, Battle for Terror was not immune to those things. Our rigging wasn't that great. You know, we had aliens and humans, and the aliens were moved fine because they didn't have any legs. And then the humans moved really weird because the rigging was, you know, I don't want to say we shortchanged it because we had a very limited budget, but, you know, it's not Pixar where they mm -hmm. can spend their R&D just on the rigging alone is was more than our budget. But uh, I, I learned another, a, a few valuable lessons on that movie over and above things like that. It was more like, I don't love CG animation. Uh, so I don't ever want to do it again. Um, that's kind of the biggest lesson I learned on Battle for Terror. Because when you make a movie, you're talking about years of your life and you better love it like you without fail. You know, you're going to have to sit through these scenes over and over and over again. Uh, and with hand-drawn, that's just where my heart is. It's, there's, especially for, because this is more adult, right? It's a pretty violent movie. Uh, I don't think human characters are quite there yet in the CG world. Mm -hmm. uh, they kind of look soulless. So, you know, we're doing 2D. I guess your question, I didn't really answer your question, which is, <laughs> <laughs> uh is it it's more expensive yeah there are but there are costs in cg that aren't in 2d okay so it's it more expensive but there's definitely differences anyway in terms of yeah i know i know what you're saying yeah i mean just yeah especially now uh as costs on computers and things come down uh our biggest cost in battle for terror was the render farm which is you do a shot at it's basically computer processing power. You know, our, our yeah. render farm there was like three or four hundred thousand dollars. You know, our render farm on Orient City is going to be about one percent of that. That's partly because it's two D, so you're not dealing with three uh, D environment, uh, so you have less processing that needs to take place, but. I understand uh, Battle for Terra uh, was originally 2D, but you made it so that they could add the 3D in later. Is that right? Yeah, well, 2D in the sense that it's not 3D. Yeah, but it's a technically it's a CG film. But yeah, we yeah. that the 3D was done post. So yeah, okay. It actually premiered at Toronto, uh, and then after Toronto, the feeling was we'll maximize our value by putting in 3D in terms of a sale. So we did the 3D post uh, that, and there were some, th another lesson I learned is about the script and Battle for Terra uh, was this, it's called Battle for. So there's obviously battles in the thing and it's actually pretty, it looks like it's for kids. And then you have all these people and aliens dying. So <laughs> after our screening at Toronto, after the screening at Toronto, the general consensus was it's way too violent for kids. So we had to, and it's not like a live action film where you go back to a cutting room and you have extra, you know, outtakes on the floor that you're going to just recut things. If you change things in animation, you have to recreate them. So mm -hmm. it's not cheap. But what we had to do was essentially pull some of the more violent things out. You know, we had bloody 
Terrian, Terrians, that was the alien race, you know, uh, in like this lab on the human ship. <laughs> that was that where it was, it was definitely not for kids. You know, there, <laughs> there was for about a week, probably there were a uh, battle for Terra in the, whatever the Burger King happy meal was called. But I was like, yeah, you're selling this to kids and there's a third act battle where everyone dies. Literally, the lead guy sacrifices himself and flies his plane into the thing and kills himself. It's <laughs> <laughs> wow. Yeah, exactly. So the other, the lesson I learned was don't straddle the line. If you're making a movie for kids, make a movie for kids, and if you're making a movie for adults, make a movie for adults. Because the uh, the director of that was kind of like, I want to make a movie for everybody, but I I really want to appeal to sci-fi fans. Sci-fi fans don't want to see. They want they're going to laugh at you when you have these child childish elements in it and that's kind of what mm -hmm. happened it didn't it existed in this world of purgatory um now for this film as well uh oh yeah no i was gonna ask you because you mentioned the whole thing with uh you know the battle between it being a kid's movie and you know uh, um having things that kids don't usually see in a kid's movie i'm just wondering because i've heard a lot of stories about censors and stuff like a film uh like the mpaa and stuff like that did you get any weird like censor notes on this thing <laughs> on battle for terror yeah just anything that stands out no anything because like... at, at the, by the time it got to that we had tr trimmed everything out that we could possibly trim out okay uh it didn't get a g rating it was pg but uh, which is like a death now, you know, when you're t making a movie for children. Is it, is PG not essentially like pretty close to the same thing though, or was it a PG thirteen or the Bible Belt of the United States? It's not the same thing. Oh, really? Just this, just a normal PG rating uh, is is actually quite a bit higher. Yeah, I mean, I never thought so, but when you're talking about the rest of the country in the United States parents obviously look at those things you know it was news to me because growing up i don't think i've ever looked at a rating or had my parents look at a rating yeah that's that's really odd to me because we we have uh we, like our rating system uh in canada is a little bit different but not really that i mean our, i guess our our rating system is not as harsh when they're rating films here but uh, like for us here, uh, G and PG are pretty much the same thing. So that's why I'm just I'm just surprised at that. <laughs> I think it's just a sign to parents across, mostly across the Bible Belt, and the, uh, that like I, I just think they're the they're country. more apt to bring their kids to or show their kids a G movie than a P yeah. PG movie. I, I I never thought about it, uh, but again, I never made a kids movie until then <laughs> and i just wanted to mention too battle for terra um this was a pretty star-studded cast you had here in this one yeah it's, the cast was amazing um you know especially at the time you know luke wilson's fallen on a bit of uh bad luck and the, since then <laughs> i yeah. don't know if we were the reason but uh <laughs> but at the time luke wilson was hot you know he was a legitimate movie star and he's the lead voice. I mean, Chris Evans is a, his uh, brother in the movie. I mean, and you got Justin Long, yeah. Evan Rachel Wood. Justin Long at the time, he was uh, starring in studio movies. You know, yeah. he's not doing that now, but like that's right when the Apple commercials came out. Uh, Evan Rachel Wood, uh, you know, James Garner was alive. It was one of his last things. Dennis Quaid, Danny Glover, uh, David Cross, right out of. Uh, Arrested Development, Ron Perlman came and did a voice off screen for a day. Uh, Danny Trejo, same thing. Now these people are, you know, more substantial. Uh, we have, you know, Mark Hamill, Phil Lamar, Phil Lamar had one line off screen. Phil Lamar is a massive voiceover actor. Uh, Mark Hamill, uh, you know, we had some really cool voices come in and, and do it, uh, partly because at the time, no one was doing independent animation, so there was, uh, I guess as an actor, there's a bit of a draw there. Yeah, and it seems to have changed over the years, because I remember, um, like, even when, like, The Simpsons started, celebrities didn't even want to use their real names. Yeah, exactly. I think Pixar, not, not so much Pixar, DreamWorks was the one that kind of shifted it, 
because in animation, the voice has never sold the animation. Yeah. Um, so DreamWorks it was like around Shrek and then Shark Tale, where if you looked at Shark Tale, the, I don't know if you remember that movie, the oh, yeah. poster for that movie was just all the voices and their names. And the commercial was just repeatedly bombarding you with this voice and this voice and this voice. Um, yeah, Will Smith, Martin Scorsese. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> and they were the ones that kind of signaled a shift in uh, voice talent and loading your animated film with voices, which then you can sell internationally. Um, and I'm wondering... Oh, sorry, go ahead. I was going to say, like, Battle for Terra, would we have gotten a theatrical release in the states if not for a voice cast i don't know i mean i'm proud of the movie for sure um but i think part of it the success that we had was the voice cast yeah and i mean um having celebrity voices is certainly not a bad thing either but i'm wondering like i'm wondering your opinion on that overall because like i i don't know i don't know if you feel the same way but i feel like in some films they tend to overuse it it's almost as if uh you're listening and you say oh who is that oh and you're thinking about it kind of distracts you from the film for a while yeah i think it depends what the movie is right if the character is a goat or something and it's this very distinct voice it's kind of distracting if the character looks like that person more then it's less distracting uh it's just and that's just my opinion films film more film specific for me uh, I think mm. Pixar does the best job because I think they can afford to because they're not selling the movie on the voices. They're getting the best voices for the movie. And when you're in that yeah. position, you, <laughs> I mean, who, who else is in that position? Not many. Um, it's, a, it's a good place to be in where people aren't saying, who's, who's in it? Then I'll go see it. it it's yeah. more like it's a Pixar movie. I'm going to go see it. Yeah, incredibly, they're sold just on the brand name alone. Yeah, and they can go for really, I don't want to say unique, or just the best voice for that part, like casting Craig T. Nelson as a voice. Like exactly. DreamWorks isn't doing, DreamWorks Animation isn't doing that. Ice Age, you know, uh, Blue Sky isn't doing that. Uh, yeah, and like I, like I don't want to, I don't want to knock DreamWorks too much. Like I, 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 I think Pixar is, is better, but I mean. Uh, um, it's, they're almost like on opposite ends of the spectrum for that. Uh, completely. And I guess that's why I choose yeah. them. I, I agree. I, there are DreamWorks movies I love. Mm -hmm. um, and there are some Pixar movies I'm not in love with. But uh, I, now, like for us in like an Orient City, I, I, I have to put some names in it uh, just because people won't look at us the same way. Right. They, if we have no names, they're going to kind of give us the cold shoulder, no matter how good the movie is. The movie could be the greatest animated samurai spaghetti western of all time. Um, mm. But if we don't have a name or two or, or three or ten, then we might get the cold shoulder from a few studios or distributors, especially internationally uh, in some territories. And in the nice thing about animation when you sell internationally is they're going to dub the voices anyway. Right. So it doesn't matter who you have, but, uh, and I'm getting into like the business of film sometimes or most of the time you better, your best bet is to sell North America first and all of the international territories will see that well, Oh, America really wants this and they'll offer more money for it. The other, the inverse is that you go sell all territories around the world before you've sold North America. And then it depends on things like who is the voice, stuff like that. Yeah, and I'd imagine when you get it um, dubbed in other countries, they tend to use uh, actors that are famous, like more famous in their countries, right? Yeah, and it depends who the distributor in that country is and can they afford them. Yeah, exactly. And I mean, it's a, like I said, there's nothing wrong with using uh, famous voices. It's just like you said, if they fit, if they fit the role, then it shouldn't be distracting anyway. Yeah, I think. Uh, do you watch? Uh, are you a Miyazaki fan at all? Uh, sorry, what was that? Are you a Miyazaki fan at all? Doesn't ring a bell. <laughs> uh, he's the uh, 
I guess they call him like the Asian Disney. Okay. Uh, he did uh, Princess Mononoke, My Neighbor Totoro. Oh, yeah, uh, I've heard Spirited of Spirited Away, yeah. Ponyo. The voices that they usually get, and those movies are done in Asia first. So the voices that they get to dub them in English are usually pretty spot on. And their their names, without being overshadowing of the film, yeah. they they do whoever whoever's casting those uh, does a good job uh, placing placing the voices. Yeah, and like like I said, like sometimes it works really well. Um, it just it's it's just to gotta just gotta avoid the the DreamWorks. <laughs> yeah, it's as a filmmaker, it's I don't want to say it's scary, but uh, it kind of on one hand is because you want the film to make money. You want the film to be seen by as many people as possible. I guess that's the angle always, you know, regardless mm -hmm. of the money. And, but you also want it to be correct. So even for Orient city, there's going to be a lot of Asian voices. There just is, there's going to be, if someone's dark skin, I need to have a dark skin voice. I, I just want that to be correct. Um, yeah. So, straddling that line between commercial and trying to live up to what I feel is correct artistically. Uh, because at the end of the day, I have this, the final say and, you know, you know I don't want the back. Uh, not, it's not even just like, Hey, this isn't right. All of a sudden it's on some message board. Hey, you cast the white guy and this guy's skin is black in the film. He's an, well, he's an asshole. <laughs> yeah, and like how much and how much is that happening now? Like that that's happening quite a bit lately. Exactly. And I don't want to be that guy that's responsible for that. Especially no. because me myself at the end of the day want that to be right. However, financing plays a part of it and sometimes you make an offer to an actor or a series of actors and they say no. And you don't mm -hmm. have control of these things. Um you know, like uh, one of the guys in the short uh, is dark skin and uh, I can make an offer to 20 actors. And once you get past those 20, because uh, he's a bit older, there's a there's a massive fall off in terms of value, uh, in terms of how much an actor is worth. And then it's like, what do I do? Do I get a dark skin actor that has zero value? Mm -hmm. And then if that's the case, there's a chance the feature never gets made because no one saw the short or uh, it didn't get picked up or, or whatever it is. I'm not saying that that's the case. That's going to be the case with Orange City. But uh, I think when you see that sort of backlash, they're not thinking it through all the way. Um, and the filmmaker sometimes gets caught in the middle of commerce and art. Yeah. And the biggest... I, that, now that we're uh, talking about this, the biggest example I could think of late, uh, recently Ghost was, in the shell. was uh, uh, Ghost in the Shell, yeah. and there was also another one. Uh, a, a big box office bomb was uh, Gods of Gods of Egypt. Yeah. Um, Gerard Butler doing a Scottish accent, <laughs> uh, his his Scottish accent, and he's a white guy playing an Egyptian. Like. <laughs> yeah, I mean, to, for Ghost in the Shell and Scarlett Johansson. Yeah, that's a, a big one. But who's you know, I think about I, and Ghost of the Shell is, uh, and Princess Mononoke are my two favorite animes. Um, so I'm, I'm, besides that whole thing, I'm actually just nervous seeing the live action version. But when you think about it and you're spending $100 million on a film, and uh, so I go through my head and say, who, who would they have gotten besides that's bigger than Scarlett Johansson? Yeah. That can carry a movie. You know, I, I understand the, uh, the outrage of it all, but who, you know, and I'm asking you right now, like who would, who would you have picked? That's more. So as a, as an, as an Asian actress. Yeah. Like a, I mean, there's lots of them, but I mean, in terms of name value, you, uh, it's, it's not. Zhang Yi from <laughs> crouched. Like once you go past two or three names. Yeah. They don't, and, but I mean, that's it. like people, a lot of people know who she is, but is she like a, a really super marketable name? Like, I, probably. She's probably the only one. Um, yeah. And past that you have. And I just did a list because Orient City has somebody of that age. And I was like, you know, what? let me just shoot for the stars. So I have I have a list. 
it, the drop off is so enormous. So you're putting a hundred million dollars up, like uh, maybe more. I don't know what the budget of, of Ghost in the Shell is, but it's not a cheap movie. No. So <laughs> I get the backlash. I understand it, but uh, on one hand, and then the other hand is, do you want to see a Ghost in the Shell live action film made? Okay, if so, then there are some concessions as a fan you need to make, and having a star play that part is one of them. Yeah, and it's it. I think it's something too. Uh, I think people sometimes forget that it, filmmaking it's a creative thing, obviously, but it's also a business, right? Yeah. And there, everybody's in the business to make money, so I think. Yeah, and it again, like I'm sure that they tossed around Asian names, but oh yeah, but how many are there? There's that can actually carry a movie and when and how many also you were saying earlier some of them might have just said no exactly they might have went to uh Zhang Yi, Zhi, if i'm even saying that properly she might have <laughs> said no she might have said no i don't want to do this or yeah. they may have went to like three or four or five and the studio isn't going to say that because then it's going to taint the movie and say oh why didn't she do it because the script's bad well, yeah, it's like it's like the director's not going to say, you know, we got Scarlett Johansson, but we actually wanted these four other girls first. But I guess we'll go with Scarlett. Exactly. I mean, when we made Battle for Terra, we probably went to 10, 15 names before Luke Wilson. Yeah. No, we did, we made an offer to Leonardo DiCaprio. Oh, wow. um, Because it was like, at the time, why not? We were offering a pretty substantial amount of money to come in for three days to record a voice for four hours a day. So we went to DiCaprio. We went to those guys. We went to The Rock, actually. Like, because we were like, well, let's take this chance. We have time. Uh, the only thing we're battling is a clock. And then if they have the same agent, you kind of have to be, like, you don't want to say, say someone's repped by, uh, say an agent reps DiCaprio. Te eight weeks later, you go in with a different actor that he reps. Because that, that guy's going to say, what did you do for the last eight weeks? You made a bunch of different offers to all these other guys. Uh, yeah. So um, then you get into that. Uh, there's a lot that goes into casting that, um, and again, I understand how where fans are coming from sometimes because I am a fan and I grew up a fan. But uh, then you're on the other side, and uh, I don't want to make excuses for anybody, but <laughs> you have a $100, $150 million movie it's hard, mm -hmm. um, especially on the Asian side. Uh, and I, I, you know what, what pains me is with all the, when the Oscars thing was happening uh, with the black parts, you look at uh, uh, the Asian parts, there's no, there's no roles for Asians. Well, that's the thing. That was, that was all about diversity, but they didn't mention any other except for, like, you know, white people and black people. I mean, there was, yeah. there was tons of, yeah. Well, what about of Asians? What, what, how come they're not getting mentioned? Yeah. Um, and they get, they get crapped on. You know, if there's an Asian in a movie, they're playing Yakuza. Yeah. Or they're playing the computer nerd. And how is that fair? I don't think <laughs> it is. Yeah, I'd say they're, I'd say they're repped far worse than any other... Uh, minority, to be honest, especially with you. for the uh, percentage of Asians in the country, and, yeah. and also the world. I mean, Hollywood's so obsessed with the Chinese market right now and getting into China, but they won't cast any Chinese actors. Uh, it's, it's frustrating. Um, it's a vicious circle too, because I mean, like we we're saying, um, there's nobody with the start with the marketing power of Scarlett Johansson, and that's I think a lot of that's because they're happy. There hasn't been people like casting uh, Chinese or Japanese or Korean actors uh, in a lot of movies to kind of build up their appeal. You know what I mean? And the ones that I watch a lot of Asian uh, movies, especially Korean. Yeah. Um, if those guys don't speak English or don't speak English well, how do you cast them in an English language movie? Then you're casting mm -hmm. them as the Asian guy that's from Asia, you know, that... Um, because yeah it's a vicious cycle yeah and then these these i feel bad for some of these guys too though because they have so much pressure on uh on them from fans to not do like stereotypical roles too right to kind of represent uh i, I don't know yeah i agree it's it's especially as the filmmaker like how <laughs> or the producers um you're trying to 
squeeze two different bosses, essentially, your boss in terms of the finances and then the boss in terms of the creative. Uh, and obviously, you want to make the best. I don't think anyone sets out to make a bad movie. You, no. Everyone sets out to make the best movie possible. Uh, obviously, some people's version of what's good is not as high as, you know, someone like Spielberg's. But uh, mm -hmm. no one sets out to make a bad movie. No one sets out to piss off the fans. Um, they have limitations on what they can do. And some, I mean, are there people that are insensitive? Of course, there are people that don't think that far ahead or they don't even, maybe there are people saying, oh, I don't care if we get an Asian for this part. Yeah. <laughs> you know, maybe there are people who say that. Uh, I haven't met all of them. Uh, most of the people I know are pretty sensitive to that, especially now. Yeah, I mean, it's a different time. You'd probably get away with it 20, 30 years ago and not really care, but I mean... 2016. <laughs> uh, you know, it's there. There are certain franchises where I think you can start grooming uh, minority actors, like a Star Wars franchise, which is good to see yeah. that they are. Uh, yeah. You know, they didn't really have that many Asians in it, but uh, <laughs> because you, Star Wars is bigger than the actor. Yeah, I mean, even the people in uh, the newest one, I mean, they're still not names yet. No, not like, I, There's pl plenty of people who probably wouldn't be able to tell you who Daisy Ridley is. Exactly. You know, but that's where actors or actresses, start, you can start grooming them to be bigger stars. And if they take off, great. Uh, if, exactly. if not, then that's on them. But uh, I, think, just, I think that's where you, you get uh, ensemble movies are really good at doing that. Yeah, you know... Uh, whether or not you, you think they're high cinema or not, Fast and the Furious is – you look at those casts, and they're, they're extremely diverse. Mm -hmm. You know, good on them. They're, they, did, they do amazing jobs of uh, diversity. Uh, yeah. They're all, they're all kind of the same movie to me. Uh, <laughs> I love the first one. But, like, three through seven now is, like, one long <laughs> – they're fun. They're, they're a lot of fun to watch, but they're all the same movie. <laughs> I like the rock in them. <laughs> yeah, he's great. I love how they have uh, Vin Diesel try to fight the rock and uh, and win, and you're like, okay. Yeah, Got okay. Vin, Di Vin Diesel's about half his size, and uh, they're having a boxing match. It's not like he's some sort of a uh, ninja. Yeah, the rock's built like a brick shit house, but okay, Vin Diesel. Yeah, I know the Vin Diesel's not a small guy, but he looks like a little midget next to the rock. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Um, what was I going to ask you? Oh, okay. No, I was going to ask you, uh, in general then, uh, we've been discussing animated films a lot, obviously, um, with, uh, uh, Orient City being an animated film and Battle for Terra, Battle for Terra. Uh, but I want to ask you, uh, personally, as a, as a producer, as a filmmaker, are you, do you have an int more of an interest one way or the other with animated or, uh, live action, or do you want to kind of stick with one or? I want to definitely be doing both. A hundred percent. Um. I that's a tough that's a good question um, the way I see it and this is dream world this isn't me uh, hopefully coming off pretentious like this is how it's going to be uh, I just directed a, a really small movie last year uh, it's live action I have another film that's in post that's live action that I wrote and produced that's a it's a much bigger film it's a massive VFX film uh, that I think is going to come out of nowhere and really surprise people you know we did the level of effects we're doing at the amount it's taking a, a while but it's going to come out of nowhere um which will hopefully put me on the map a little more in terms of bigger and better films uh my goal all right to get back to the question uh, the animated film is going to take about uh 18 months 20 months so my goal is to be doing always be doing an animated film while also doing live action films because there are two different processes for me. Uh, I'm not an actual animator. I'm mm -hmm. writing and I'm co-directing, which means that uh, I'm reviewing every storyboard that comes in. We're adjusting the storyboards together. Uh, we're doing the animatic, which is where we lay the storyboards out and then revise them and revise the edit based on those. Uh, and then I'm directing the voice cast. Uh, but John Boar is directing the animation itself. Um, so the goal is for, once that's done, I'm just reviewing dailies, essentially, uh, which frees me up 
to be doing live action stuff. So I won't be able to do live action now until December uh, mm -hmm. because I'll be writing the Orient City thing unless I finish a bit early on the script. Um, I have my next, what I hope, project, live action project. A lot of it depends on what happens with this other one. It's called Suburban Cowboy. Okay. It's being sold right now. Um, it went out to distributors right before Tribeca, which is in April. Knowing that Tribeca was about to come up and then can just happened. So the idea was to put it on distributors' radars so that when they went into Tribeca and when they went into Cannes, they, they had it in the back of their head that this project was still on their plate. Uh, and then hopefully we find a home for it at the end of this month, early June. Uh, and then I'll be able to get better traction because I don't want to do the next one at the same budget. I mean, mm -hmm. I can. I don't want. I don't want to. Uh, even if I get double the budget, it's still nothing. Uh, when I say I did this micro budget, it's micro budget. Uh, it looks much bigger than it than it costs uh, because I think that's probably my biggest skill or best skill is maximizing um, the value. Well, that's a good thing to have, especially uh, for independent film, right? Yeah, it's that's everything, right? I mean, that's your value as a, at least as on the product producer side. And then hopefully, I mean, everyone that's seen it so far has said that they liked it. It's, uh, you know, it's a small movie, but it's held together well. And I obviously can hold a movie together. <laughs> I don't know, you know, they don't know if they're saying that to be nice to you, but I, most of the comments have been pretty genuine because they're coming through the agents. And if distributors are saying those things and haven't passed yet, and they're kicking it up the food chain, then they obviously mean them. Um, it's when you get a pass from a distributor and they say, oh, the performances were good. And you go, okay. Yeah. Th thanks. That means you hated just, it. Just kind of, uh, it's great. Yeah. Yeah. Because yeah. um, I've been there. I, I mean, I get scripts sent to me all the time. And 99% of them are bad. Um, at least, or, or I don't want to say they're bad. They're not for me. So, but I'm not going to say that in an email back, I'm going to say, hey, I had a lot of fun with this, but unfortunately it's a pass for me. Or I'll find something nice to say about it. Yeah. Um, <laughs> and, uh, you know, I'm not the only one that does that. So you got to take everything well, that, with a grain of salt. Yeah, I was going to say that's cool because there's there probably are some people that would probably wouldn't, uh, like if they, t I, well, I don't know, actually. Are there people that maybe take a pass that maybe don't have anything nice to say? They just like pass? Yeah, all the time. Oh, yeah? Okay. Uh, but, you know, it's such a small industry. It really is. It, it, as massive as it seems, uh, if you're an asshole to somebody because you think that they're nobody at the time, a year or two years from now, they'll, li they'll wind up at the, you know, uh, well, there's two, two versions, right? The exec version, where if you're an asshole to a low-level executive or an assistant, that person's not going to be the assistant forever. Mm -hmm. What happens when they get promoted? And maybe they're talented at their job and they were just needed a break. So they were an assistant for a minute. Three years, five years from now, they're running a studio. You were an asshole to them because you thought you were a hotshot director. Um, <laughs> it's not good. And then the other yeah. is if you're an executive and maybe someone's script isn't up to what you think is good. Uh, but that person potentially is going to grow as a writer. Or maybe that person isn't the best writer, but they're actually a really good director uh, or vice versa and you're an asshole to them or you give them a hard pass and say this is crap or or whatever it is and i know executives because i went to usc and a lot of my friends are execs or agents or whatever that do that they think that they're super important and their opinion is the only opinion that matters so they're assholes uh, and you know those directors blow up or the writer writes his next script and it's awesome and all of a sudden, that person is like, shit, I hope this guy doesn't remember me because I'm going to email him about writing a script. Uh, and everyone's memory is short uh, or long. You know, they're going to remember. Mm -hmm. uh, and I don't want to seem like I'm the nicest guy in the world and I don't have anybody that I've wronged uh, because <laughs> I'm sure there are people out there that if they were like, oh, Ryan Clucci, he's a dick. Um, <laughs> I hope not. You know, I, I don't think I've been that much of an asshole to anybody. Well, I mean, as long as you're not consciously going around, you know, 
pass. That's a you know steaming pile of turd. Yeah, no, absolutely not. Uh, yeah. You know, I would, uh, for the reasons that I just said, because you don't know what's exactly. going to happen to somebody, and also you don't know. Uh, you know, someone could be 18 writing a script. You know, the, what my scripts at 18 compared to my script now is a completely different writer. It's I've gotten so much better, or even five years ago. So you don't know. Um, and so, sometimes someone writes a bad script, but the idea behind it or the property is good. So maybe you want to buy that property and then hire a better writer to rewrite it. Um, just be nice. You don't. Yeah. It it doesn't hurt you to not be an asshole. Yeah, and and I, I I don't get. I never got that. Like I never got why why be like that. You know what I mean? Yeah. I mean, I think that anyone that would say that about me would be somebody from being on set. Uh, but even then, uh, I go out of my way. I've been on sets where the director thinks of everybody as low level scum. Uh, and it's embarrassing it really is because it's like you're not curing cancer dude you're directing a movie and yeah uh with suburban cowboy it was my first as a director not just a producer and uh it was really important to me to down to the pas not just be like all right you're hired over an email or something just because someone was willing to do it they everyone had to come in i had to meet them face to face we had to i had to like because they have to we have to all be on set and live together. And this is my first thing. And I was like extremely worried that would go off the rails. So you need, if there's one bad apple, even if it's a PA, it, it's toxic because you're on mm -hmm. set long periods of time and it's a pressure cooker. So um, I think on my last one, everyone was, it, it was great. It was, and it worked uh, in terms of meeting everybody, knowing everybody pretty intimately down to the last PA where I show up to and be like, hey, how's it going? How's your mom? And we were so efficient that we shaved a day off our schedule on that film. And you're talking about a micro budget film and to do that is really hard. And it had nothing to do with me. It had to do with the fact that our crew was so efficient and good and there was no bad apples. Yeah, and I mean, um, it, it kind of reminds me, I'll, I'll say his name right on here. Uh, have you heard, know of uh, director Ron Maxwell? No. Uh, the film Gettysburg. Okay, yeah. Um, I he actually was down here filming uh, a movie called Copperhead a few a few years ago. Yeah, I've seen Copperhead. And yeah, okay, and I was an extra in that film. Nice. Um, and it, yeah, and you're talking about directors who are personable with everyone. This is a guy who could, would come up to the extras and actually like direct them instead of his like ads and pas. I mean, they did most of it, but he would come up and talk to everyone. Like he wasn't that sort of. Uh, well, there was a hierarchy, but he, you know what I mean. He wasn't like uh, I, I'm the king of the mountain kind of thing. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. That was that was that was really. It was almost jarring. It goes <laughs> it goes a long way, right? Because I, I get I bet yeah. if the next time he came to town to do something, he'd be like, yeah, I want to go back. Exactly. And I'll yeah. take a day off work and go be an extra. Um, I think you know when you're doing these lower budget movies, no one's getting paid that well. You know, to, to assume oh you're getting paid, so just do your job and shut up. Um. You know, they could be doing 10 other jobs uh, for the most part. So treat them like if you were in that job and you want to be treated. And then if, you know, I guess the inverse is like that person needs to hold up their end of the, the bargain and, you know, do their job well, not just be a good human being. Yeah, exactly. Uh, you know, animation is different because it's basically an office set setting. You have a bunch of cubicles uh, for the most part, and uh, it's just like an office where you have office politics and things like that rather than set politics. Mm -hmm. uh, and actors come in for a day, sometimes three, two days. It's, it's really, it, uh, when I did Battle for Terra, it's not at all what I was prepared for. You know, where the rest of the kids that I graduated USC with are schmoozing and getting lunches and dinners with agents and managers and stars i'm you know figuring out how many cubicles we need in this office and figuring out how much how, what the temperature of our render form needs to be you know like things i wasn't trained for yeah exactly or that weren't so uh sexy so to speak <laughs> um 
Okay, so I'm just just started this thing with the last episode, so I'm just gonna basically uh, ask you a question at the end uh, pertaining to, I guess, the film that you're promoting or what you're ta- what we talked about. So I'm just gonna ask you um, if you can name one film that sticks out to you as having some of the best animation you've ever seen. What would that movie be? Ooh, best animation. So it's not my best animated film; it's the best animation. Not necess- yeah, not necessarily the best film. But the the I guess the most like the animation you were just like really impressed with. Uh, Ghost in the Shell. Ghost in the Shell. Uh, yeah, I have a very specific reason. It was the first time I had ever seen an animated hand drawn animated film that wasn't for kids. Okay. So it's not necessarily my favorite. It's in my top few animated films. Princess Mononoke is probably my favorite animated film. But Ghost in the Shell, I saw before that, uh, and I was just blown away by the animation and the fact that it was like, wow, this they make animation for people like me. <laughs> they make animation for nerds. <laughs> awesome. Um, all right, well, hey, I want to mention again, uh, kickstarter.com. You can go search for uh, Orient City on there. I'll post the link underneath the video as well. Um, we have a ton you can see all the artwork all the character design uh just give us all i all i think all we ask is that you check it out if you decide not to back it cool just check us out i think uh, yeah it, you'll be impressed by the level of the artwork that we're doing and hey you know what if you like it i mean even like sharing it on your facebook so other people can see it and spread it spreads the word too right yeah it'd be so. amazing <laughs> Um, we're grateful we're i mean when people put in a dollar i'm grateful because yeah you could be spending that dollar on a million other things so uh you know i'm not we're not the filmmakers that are going to take your money and run laughing Uh, we're going to kill ourselves to make this hopefully someone when someone like me answers that question in a few years they say orient city that's our (laughs) honestly that's our goal that i mean there's not we're not looking to make an okay movie. We're not looking to make a good movie. We're looking to make um, something that could win an Oscar one day. Uh, it sounds pretentious, but I think if you don't shoot for those stars, you're never going well, no, to reach if you that just, level. Yeah, if you just aim for the middle, you, yeah. <laughs> you know what I mean? But I think that, um, you know, and part of that rests in my lap, and I don't know. <laughs> Hopefully I'm up to the challenge in terms of the script, but I think on the uh, the art side, no one right now is doing it at that level that level on the hand drawn side you know if they are there it's for kids and yeah, a lot of exactly. anime is very anime and it's you need to be a fan of anime for it and i think hopefully with our story content we we transcend anime and are appealing to uh, people that like things like kill bill and the robert rodriguez films and yeah, you're trying to make it more accessible, basically. Yeah, I mean, this is uh, we're trying to make a movie we want to see. Yeah, <laughs> I think that's what I think that's what anyone should do when they're trying to make a movie. I mean, if you don't want to see the movie you're making, <laughs> you're probably not making a good yeah, movie. Like I said earlier, I mean, this, you're spending so much time on these things. If you don't love it, if you, listen, I I don't want to name names, but I have a lot of friends that they came out here to or to Hollywood to get laid. You know, they yeah. weren't that cool, I guess. They they thought, hey, I'll do something fun and exciting. Hollywood is not that much that fun and exciting. If you ever been on, you were an extra on set. It is boring. Yeah. It is yeah, grueling, taxing, long. Uh, it's waiting for about nine hours, filming for about one, and then waiting for another hour or two. <laughs> exactly. And now in animation, wait about a month for about thirty seconds of artwork. Yeah. Uh, so this is the la- you have to have love for what you're doing you have it has to be a labor of love and i think it'll show um otherwise you get you know there are fu- movies that are fun that aren't necessarily good um and i think it shows just go to netflix you know so it's, it's a wasteland of bad <laughs> bad movies yeah. i mean you can you can tell when their heart's not in it yeah exactly all right. Well, hey, um, like I said, uh, check out that website, guys. Uh, even just share it on your Facebook. Check it out. Watch the video. There's the opening uh, the opening sequence played at the top of the show here. Uh, there's lots of artwork you can check out as well. And, 
Yeah, hey, I know. I want to thank you very much for stopping by as well, and good luck with the with the film. Oh, thank you so much for having me. Hopefully, I uh, hopefully I gave good answers. It was perfect. <laughs> All right. Thank you.